Hello, and happy Data Saturday for everyone who's uh, doing data on a Saturday. Let's see. I think it's a little better. Anyway, welcome to uh, Data Science Live Streaming. My name is Carl, and I'm a data scientist in Silicon Valley, California, where I'm guilty to admit we have a lovely day. I'm so sorry to all the people out there who are freezing. Uh, it's basically, you know, 60 something and sunny, that's Fahrenheit, you know, like 20 degrees and sunny Celsius, California. Anyway, all right, so we are talking data science. I'm here to talk about regression data set preparation. And uh, if you haven't seen my streams before, I start out with a bunch of talking and background explanation to kind of get you up to speed in case you've never seen me talk about this before. Um, and as usual, I'm playing music from the, the copyright free stream on Twitch. Let me know if the music is too loud or, or if you can't hear it, if it's too soft, either way. But we are going to talk about fighting churn with data, and I guess I'll just get into it. So in the beginning, I'm just going to do some talking about the background, and then after about 10 or 15 minutes, I'll get into the actual Python and SQL and some live data science. So let's see, how do I start? I start by saying, what is churn? For everyone who hasn't heard of this before, churn is when subscribers, customers, or users quit. Could be unsubscribing from a Twitch or YouTube stream or unfollowing, I guess. Uh, also canceling a subscription that you're paying for, like you know Netflix or Hulu. And I've actually been seeing the word churn more and more in the news. Oh, hey, Maddie, you're still awake, amazingly. Thank you for joining all the way from Central Europe. Uh, Switzerland, right? I have to tell you about how I did some of my PhD at the um, ETH in uh, Switzerland. ETH, I guess they say. But that's a long story. I shouldn't go into it now. I'm saying, what is churn? So churn comes from the churn rate, which is the percentage of customers that quit. And I had another stream on calculating churn rates. Uh, big fun. And churn is also a verb nowadays. You can say like the customer churned or I'm churning from Netflix because I'm going to read more books. This is my book reading t-shirt, by the way. I'd rather be reading. <laughs> not quite true. Not right now. I'd rather be doing this. But maybe tonight I'll be reading and not streaming Netflix. We'll see. Anyway, you can also use churn as a noun and say like make a churn around. No, wait, Maddie, I didn't do my PhD at the ETH. I have to correct. I did a collaboration with a lab there. I did my PhD in Pasadena, but my professor knew some professors at the AT Ha, and I visited there uh, twice. I spent something like three or four weeks there altogether. Anyway, tell you about it later. Uh, okay, so this is what churn is. What is fighting churn with data? That's the book that I wrote uh, recently. It came out. It's based on my experience as chief data scientist at Zora. Um, and I'm gonna make a little announcement in one second. Scott knows what this is, but the book is out now and there's a discount code here. So I have to announce for the first time live on this stream that my days as the chief data scientist at Zora are over. It's official. I have moved on to a different company. Um, it's in the fintech sector. You can definitely find all about it on my LinkedIn. But I just want to say, so I'm not like faking or fronting anything. I'm no longer with Zora, although I had many great years there. Um, and it led to all my experiences doing with Churn. Well, actually, I started Churn before Zora. But anyway, Zora was, is a company where you can you run your subscription business on it like a platform. And so everyone knows Zoom right here on the bottom. Zoom is also now a noun and a verb this year due to everyone sheltering in place. And so Zoom manages their subscribers and subscriptions all on Zora. So when you sign up for Zoom, your customer data actually goes to Zora's secure data center, which we provide, as, or not we, because I'm not there anymore. I have to start, stop saying that. But Zora provides this as a service to many of these companies that you see, you see here, HBO, GitHub, um, lots of famous companies you've heard of, but you've never heard of Zora. Anyway, I worked on churn for a bunch of these companies while I was the head of data science there. And that was where I got my experience. 
Yep, thanks for congrats on the new job. It's funny how everyone says that. Um, I mean, congratulate me if the new job goes well, I guess, but you know. Anyway, so that's what Zora is. That's how I got my churn experience. And okay, really quick, why should you learn about churn? Uh, it's the most common data science problem in the world because every company has a churn problem, every product or service. But it's really kind of special. It's not like a lot of other you know, data science problems in a lot of ways, which I talk about. And it's a great way to learn data science foundations, at least if you learn it from me, because we're talking about going from raw data to final results that are actionable. So what is actionable for churn? Like, what does it mean to fight churn with data, really? It means to take steps to reduce your churn using your data. And one example is making a great product. And you can use your data to make a great product without, service, su without surveying your users. That's the usual approach. Ask, you want to find out what's good in your product, survey your users. But I say use your data from churn, and we'll see how. You can also use data to power your marketing and you know, target messages directly at the customers who, who want them. Oh really, Scott's new, Scott also I know started a new gig recently and his, says, his boss says, how do we adjust churn? Totally makes sense. Um, well, you address it with targeted messaging to engage your customers. You address it also with customer success, which you also want to use your data to target. So your customer success team goes right to the people who need help. And also, uh, you fix up your sales and pricing. A lot of people think that reducing churn just means giving away discounts, but that's really not a great way to reduce churn because it undermines your pricing structure. You could have a multi-tier pricing plan, like you know, you know, uh, the basic, standard, and premium plans set up, and then you can like move people around on the plans to fight churn, so that everyone's getting a good value for their money, but without you know giving out discounts, which like you know. They, you give out a discount and then they just want more. That's how it goes. Anyway, I think that's all the intro. Let's look at some of the data. So what data do we use when we're fighting churn? If you haven't seen it before, we I show churn uh, examples from a simulation, which uh, is explained in the book, and we're just gonna kind of dive into it now. So the most important part of the simulated data is events and I already have a query prepared here to select from an event table and there's an event type table um, like a normalized type table to give you the type of the events and if you look at this data whoops it's kind of small if you look at the events it's a social network the simulation so there are events like liking and viewing ads uh, and also messaging and replying. And it's not real, these are pretend customers, but these events all have a customer ID for the pretend customer and a time that the simulated event took place. And then of course there's a type. So all these events link back to the people using the service and we measure them with customer uh, metrics. Maybe we can find some metrics. Let's see. Mm -mm. Here's an old query. Maybe I should just uh, go back to the last one. So the metrics are, there's also a metric table. Maybe I could just modify this one. Say, so metric, inner join, metric, I think type name or something. Metric, I'm trying to remember all the names of these tables. You'd think I'd know them by now. So this should hopefully show us the metrics, or I'll have to check the table names. All right, what did I name my table? Let's go back to the schema, and I will just really quickly check the metric table. It's just metric name. All right, that's the problem. It's not metric type name, it's just metric name. Oh, and there's no event time. Let's just run this so we'll see some customer metrics. Okay, so here's examples of customer metrics, which are summaries of the number of events that each customer had, like likes per month um, is a basic event. And it looks like these are all likes per month. All right, I'm missing all the chat, but that's cool. Oh yeah, Maddie points out, discounting sometimes causes higher churn because customers feel betrayed by the original price, or at least they'll take the discount and then ditch you. Um, so I think what he meant is that customers feel like 
oh, you had this lower price all along, but you were hiding it from me. And it's true, because it shows that the company really did have a lower price they would give you. I don't know. Anyway, don't do discounting, but do use customer metrics to understand your customers. And I think that's enough of a look at the data to actually start um, going forward in the stream. Yeah, well, the truth is the high discounts that will, you often see are like, in America at least, it's on cable TV companies that used to have a monopoly. So they had a monopoly price for years when you could only get you know, lots of channels through cable or satellite. Now, of course, with you know, internet TV, it's all falling apart and they have to kind of reduce their prices from, you know, they no longer have a monopoly. So anyway, if you want, if you don't know how to set this up, it's all on my GitHub repo, which is carl24k byte-churn. And of course you have to clone the repo, you'll have to install Postgres and Python, and then you run a simulation to produce all that data. And if you've been following along, I've been building up a lot of stuff with the data for like weeks and weeks. We're up to like chapter seven and eight um, of the book at this point. So I think I've got a summary of the data set. No, okay, first I'm gonna talk about how we do some analysis. And then we'll look at some data, real data in just a sec. So how do we do, how do we see what behaviors lead to churn and what behaviors lead to your customers staying longer? Well, you could use regression and machine learning, and I, we're not using it yet, although we're getting ready to use regression. Um, for now, we're gonna use visualization and analytics because when there's a really strong relationship between churn and behavior, you don't need to use a regression to understand it and prove it out. So, um, so here, I'm so, I love this quote from Ernest Rutherford, which is that if you need to use statistics to understand your experiment, then you ought to have done a better experiment, which I take to mean that you wanna see a strong result in a visualization without, um, if it's so such a strong result, you won't need to check the statistics to prove it. Let's look at an example, which I think makes it clear. This is a, a case study for a company called Versature, which is a telco operating in Canada. Actually, they're like voice over IP, you know, so they're voice over the internet business phone service. And this shows, this chart shows the churn rate versus the number of calls that a Versature customer makes each month. Now you can't see the actual churn rate because this is a real company and their churn rate is a very sensitive piece of information. Um, Versature, I will say, has an enviably low churn rate, so don't mess. But anyway, this shows that uh, I call it a metric cohort chart because I group the customers into cohorts based on the metric. And the bottom cohort is the, like the bottom decile, the bottom 10%. And then if you have 10 cohorts, they would be deciles, and then this would be the top 10%. And you can clearly see that the top cohorts in making calls have a much lower churn rate than the bottom cohorts. And there's a very quick fall off. So the bottom cohort really has a high churn rate. And you, you get up to about the, the target, you know, the elbow of the churn rate curve about halfway. But so that to me proves the hypothesis that making more calls per month on Versature is good for churn. Uh, from, you know, meaning the customers churn less. Now, what about what customers pay? This is my favorite example. Do people churn more or less when they pay more for a service? Surprisingly, for many services, they churn less. And that's what this cohort plot shows. Um, it's showing you the amount they pay in normalized monthly recurring revenue, or MRR. And you can see that the top cohorts in what they pay churn at about half the rate of those who are paying the least, this bottom cohort up here. Now, do people like paying more? Is that why they don't churn? No, this is a case of correlation. So this shows the correlation between making calls and between paying how much they pay. So the people who pay more also make more calls, and that's really the reason they don't churn. But it's not very satisfying, and a better way to look at it is with a ratio of what they pay to how much they use. And then it's like a unit cost. So this shows churn versus dollars per call. And here you can actually see that those who pay the most per call do churn the most, and a lot more. Um, you know, if they're in this cohort at the top, you're churning at about four times the rate of these cohorts down here that have the good price. 
So that's one example of understanding churn without statistics and regression. Even though we're getting ready to use regression, it's still good to look at this stuff. Here's a quick example from the simulation. Uh, we looked, it's a social network, and this is churn versus the number of posts they make per month. I think that's posts per month. Yep. Here you can actually see the churn rate because this is a simulation. You know, you can know the, the churn rate in the simulation. It's about 5%. So this is churn versus posts per month. This is churn versus the number of ads viewed per month. And you'd think that viewing ads is bad, right? The more people view ads, the more likely they should be to churn. But it's another correlation story. Um, viewing ads and posting is highly correlated, as shown here. Um, it's very smooth and normal looking because it is a simulation. Um, see, good conversation about churn in the chat, but I'm going to keep going. This is what you see when you look at ads views per post. So this is a ratio metric example from the simulation showing that, um, well, the people who have zero ads and zero posts churn the most because they're the ones who aren't using the service at all. Then the best people, you know, have a high ratio of posts per ad, but, you know, they're not at zero. But then the more ads per post the customer sees, actually the more likely they are to churn. So these top cohorts that have just seen a lot of ads, they got really pissed and they churned. At least that's what the simulation is telling you. Okay, so this is all the catch up, I think, from the previous streams. This is pretty much where we left it in last week's stream. We had done all this. Oh, actually, well, here, here's a reminder of what we did previously. We looked at all those ratio metrics. Uh, then we looked at percent of total, which is another kind of ratio, and percent change metrics. That was all last stream. We also looked at measuring the time since event with another metric. And we looked at using long time periods to average metrics when the event is rare and short time periods to estimate metrics for new customers. And that was all last stream. And having done all this, we had created a data set. Um, and this is a summary of what's in the data set. So what do I mean by data set? If you haven't seen a data set, I'll show you our data set so far. This is in an Excel spreadsheet, which just, you know, lets you see it easily. Um, so the data set has, you know, a metric in every column and every row is a customer and whether or not they churned. And now we've got a lot of uh, metrics in the data set now because we were adding all those ratios. But you see there's something weird here. There's actually a lot of zero columns still in this data set. Actually, I think this is an old version and there's a few less. But actually, if you look here in the summary stats, now let's look at the summary statistics. Um, we have the basic, me the, the churn measurement at the top, it's 5%, and then all these other metrics. The non-zero column means what percent of the customers have the metric. And as you can see, the basic metrics are all, most of the, the customers have them. But then we have all these zeros down here, and that's because we never calculated these metrics. Um, they were defined in the data set, but I never got up to calculating them. So these are other ratios, reply per message, like per post, post per message, unfriend per new friend, and then another version of unfriend per new friend, all have not been calculated. And that's gonna be one of the, the, the tasks we have to get out of the way on today's stream. And we'll look at the how we make this table of statistics later. I think once we've got the whole data set created, we can run it again. So for today, the first thing we I have to do is finish the data set. So that means I have to calculate these additional ratio metrics, and we'll do that first. Then we're gonna look at, um, while they're calculating, we'll have to kill time. So we can do a little analysis on the unfriend and uh, the unfriend metric and then we can analyze the new ratio metrics we're going to calculate and this shouldn't take us that long and then we're going to get up to I, I said we're going to prepare the data for regression and we are but I also need to finish calculating all these so I'm going to show everyone who's doing with a book how this works and we can you know review some of the old code so we calculate ratio metrics with a SQL script actually that's kind of one of the foundations of my feature engineering approach is to calculate things in the database using SQL. 
So let's look at this ratio metric SQL. We'll go to our first code example for the day. The ratio metric, uh, no, is in chapter seven. So this is the code you get from the book. It's divided up by chapter and seven one will insert the ratio metric. I'll show this quickly. Well, maybe I should get it running first, actually. Let me get it running first because we're gonna calculate several metrics and we can talk about it once it's already running. So I need to get to a configuration to, that I had to run these. It's 7.1, but I, need, I have extra versions. So we use the same code, but we have mul I have multiple versions that you can run with the program that comes with a book. Basically, there's a program that comes with a book that makes it easy to run all these. And I wrote down here, I need to run versions 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So I'm just going to do that. Four, five, six, seven. This is actually run ratio insert. I was really lazy in, in labeling all of my configurations here. So this is what we're going to try to run. I'm just gonna start it out by running the program and then I can talk more about what it's doing. So this is gonna print out each version of the SQL that it's running. Now, how does it do different versions? It's because if we look at the original SQL here, um, there are bind variables. So here I'm inserting the met into the metric name table and I fill in, each time I execute this query, I fill in the metric name. So the first version I'm running is reply per message. This is the filled in version. Okay, deborgism, an irrelevant question. Do you recommend to normalize the data before splitting into train, test, or after? Uh, that's actually a good question. Actually, and it's more subtle than you think. Technically, what you should do is you should normalize on the training set and then fix the constants that you use to normalize it. It's actually a really great question because there's an example of doing this kind of later in the stream. But basically, you want to do your normalization on the training data. And you know, normally to do that, you need to save the mean and standard deviation. This is to all the people who really know data science well, you know this, and we'll see it later in the stream. But then you want to fix the constants of your normalization and use them on the test set. And that's to, a, it's a kind of overfitting, or it's actually, it's not overfitting. It's like a cheat, you're cheating, basically. If you redo the normalization on the test set, because in a real case, in a real machine learning application, you would fix the constants for normalizing on your training data, and then you'd go live and you'd be predicting out of sample in a real business case. And then your constants of normalization would have been fixed. Anyway, it's kind of digressing, but we do need something to talk about while all these ratio metrics calculate. Let's see how far I've gotten. Calculated one, two, hey, it looks like they might even all be done already. Whoop. Mm, yeah, seems like they're all done. Well, anyway, just to finish explaining this sequel after our digression. All right, good night, Maddie. Sorry I do these so late, but it's, you know, too early in California otherwise. So to calculate a ratio metric, I actually use common table expressions and select out the numerator into one common table expression, and that's using a bind variable and the denominator into another common table expression, again, using a bind variable. And then the calculation of the ratio metric is an insert statement combined with a select statement, joining the denominator and the numerator in a left outer join. Um, that's so you calculate a value whenever the denominator is present, and the coalesce statement fills the numerator with zero when necessary. And so this is how we calculated all these ratio metrics, hopefully. We were just trying to calculate them. And it seems to have run without error. So whatever I was supposed to do while they were calculating, I guess I won't do it, because it doesn't take that long to calculate these. Now I'm gonna check that they actually calculated correctly by doing select star from the metric name table that I now remember the name of. And I'm just gonna check, so I should yeah, I should have just been calculating these. Reply per message, like per post, post per message, unfriend per new friend, and this other version, which we'll talk about in a minute. All right, so that was the first thing I was supposed to do. If I go back to my to-do list, 
I'm not che I'll check that the values of the metrics later when we do the stats. So the first thing I was supposed to do was uh, calculate those metrics. Now we actually have to do some analysis. I was going to look at the cohort analysis on unfriend scaled and and the scaled and unscaled version is actually the next thing I was supposed to talk about. So let's look at that real quick. What am I talking about scaled and unscaled? I'm going to do a quick review from last week's stream. If you measure a rare event over multiple months, in this case, supposedly the event only happens once every couple of months, you can average over multiple months, but then you can still describe it as a count per month, as an average. So in this case, you could say, you know, one third or 0.33 events per month. Then you can also, on the I'm going through this quick, by the way, because we did it last week. Um, then you can also use scaling when you measure new customers. So what if you have less than a month of data? For example, customer uh, three in this case, who's this one, you only have a few weeks of data. So if you measure 19 events for customer three in their, in their first uh, 19 days, no, they've, they've been a customer 19 days, you measure nine events, and so then you can estimate that they'll have 13 events at the end of their first month. So you do this scaling, and we did that last week to calculate the, uh, the unfriend per month metric. So let me go back and, hold on. If we go back, I can review with you a little bit, the unfriend per month, or these metrics down here. So the normal unfriend per month metric was rare. Only 26% of accounts had an unfriend per month metric. And when we looked, then let's look, look at the churn, the, the cohort analysis. So somewhere in this folder, I should have an unfriend per month. Uh, let me try to find it. We should have done this already. So unfriend, See, is that it? I'm looking for the cohort analysis. I should have had this prepared, of course. I guess this, no, this isn't it. Well, let's just run it and figure it out. So we're gonna run the unfriend per month cohort analysis. Let's just like say, what was I supposed to do here? Run version 14 is the note that I made for myself. So let's do a cohort analysis. This is the first one we're running the code. So we can step through it. So we're actually gonna run the cohorts here. Um, I'm supposed to do version 14. And I'll, we'll see in a sec how we do a cohort analysis. So here we are in listing 5.1 from the book. And this is gonna show you how to do a cohort analysis in Python. It's assumed the data set is saved to a path that you pass in. And so the first thing we do in the code is check that our data set path is valid. Then we load the data set into a pandas data frame. PD, if you don't know, is pandas. That's like the typical way people uh, abbreviate that. The QCut function is short for quantized discretization. That's what actually calculates the cohorts. So after I run this one line here, I will have my data broken into cohorts called the, gr the group variable here is actually a series, as you can see, indicating the cohort for each example. So then I use more pandas functions group by to calculate the mean of the metric in each cohort and the churn rate in each cohort. I put the data into another pandas data frame, which I create right here. And at this point, the cohort analysis is basically done. If we look at it uh, in the debugger, well, you can see that only two cohorts were calculated. And the rest is going to be the, the plot functions. That's using matplotlib pyplot package, also everyone's Python favorite. And these remaining steps are just gonna make the rest of the cohort plot. So I'm just gonna run them and then go back to my folder here. And then we can see the unfriend per new friend, which we just created. So here's the new cohort analysis that was done, but it only has two cohorts. And why is that? If you remember from the statistics, 
uh, only 25% of the customers had a non-zero value on this metric. So, it, so QCUT will actually scale the number of cohorts or groups that it forms based on the distribution of your data. And with 75% of the customers have zero, they're all in this cohort here with an, the average 5% churn rate. And then for the other cohort, well, actually, it can't all be zeros, but these are the people with low unfriends per month. Because you can see the mean in that cohort is 0.25. Then in this cohort, the mean is 2, and they have almost a 7% churn rate. So that's our first result. That's using the unscaled version of the metric. Now remember, when we, when we calculated this, this scaled version, what we achieved is we got coverage up to 49%. That's the last row of the table here. Um, and we did that by playing with the time frame that we measure it for. So we have kind of similar distribution statistics in terms of the mean, um, the standard deviation, and the percentiles shown here. But we're covering 50% of the population now with the metric. And that was the point of doing all that scaling. And I just wanted to show you the example of what that does to the cohorts. Now to do this, um, I actually have to make a new configuration. There are configurations that the book code runs on and it's all in a, a JSON file that comes you know, with it. And this, uh, I have this configuration system because it allows you to run the same code on multiple different data sets. Now you probably won't have that problem immediately in your, in your own career, but I had to you know, run the same code on multiple data sets. And I didn't want to hard code everything. So I have this configuration here. So I need to find the, the listing to make the metric cohort, which is actually in chapter five. Whoops, I'm in the wrong, it's all, so the whole JSON is broken down by chapter, as you can see. JSON stands for uh, JavaScript Object Notation, if you haven't heard. So in the cohort plot, I need to make a new version. Um, and I'm going to use it, I'm going to base it off of version 14 was the one that I just ran. I have a lot of versions here, as you can see. Uh, some of them I made live on the stream. Looks like I'm up to 50, <laughs> 52. And here I want to use unfriend per month. What's actually the name of the metric now? I want to use the scaled version, which I went to so much trouble to create. Um, it's going to be this one. So I'm just going to copy the string from this spreadsheet so I don't have to try to spell it. So this should be my new version, version 52. You know, same data set and just a different column. And so let's see. I should have done this at the end of last stream, but it took too long last stream. You might remember there were some issues. So now I'm just going to run the cohort plot and let's see if it just works. And now we should have a new result for the same metric, but using the scaled version. And let's see, how does it look? Ah, it looks terrible actually. Hmm. Well, that shows that not everything works out so well. You definitely see that there are more cohorts. Hmm. But due to random variation, this cohort actually has a much uh, higher churn rate. <laughs> I don't really know. Okay, maybe the original version didn't look so bad, since this one sort of looks like a mess. But I guess it shows that the unfriend per month metric is really not that strong in terms of churn. I think that's actually what it's showing. You'd think that unfriending per month would be bad, right? Maybe this is another correlation case. And it looks a little bit bad here. This is the, the churn cohorts for just plain unfriend per month, so it does seem somewhat higher the more unfriends you have. This version, this noise makes it look like the relationship is that maybe not so strong. But we'll look at that again later. But at least I've accomplished the goal of showing you how to do a new cohort analysis based on the metric we made last stream. And we'll come back to unfriend per month in just a minute because there's another metric which is unfriend per new friend, which we're gonna have to calculate. So, we, so now we did this, um, we looked at this, we now did look at cohort on unfriend scaled and unscaled. That was the next part I was supposed to do. 
And now I'm supposed to analyze the other new ratio metrics. Remember, we just cranked out several more new ratio metrics. And now I'm gonna do, well, I inserted the metrics into the database, remember, with that SQL. Now I need to re-extract the data set. There's actually several steps I need to take. Well, first I need to re, not too many, but first I need to re-extract the data set, and then we can maybe rerun those statistics. I don't have that written here. And then redo the new cohort plot. So, first, extracting the data set is done with listing 7.2. And we can take a quick look at that one also. Extracting the data set uses one of my favorite, whoops, this doesn't look like it. Which, did I say it's in this chapter? Oh no, it is, it's this version. Here we go, 7.2 data set. Sorry there. So this big SQL is actually used to extract the data set. Because remember, the metrics are all in the database. And this is my SQL trick for creating a data set from a metric table. You have to put each metric into one column and you do that with these case statements in a sum aggregation. So each one of these sum case statements combined, hello, hey C Films, I'm doing great. Just saw your message. Welcome back, bonjour. I don't know if you're a French, French speaker if, or if you're just busting out the French to impress us. Um, I studied French, but my French is terrible, so don't ask me to try. <laughs> anyway, so this is a big SQL, which will extract our new data set. I'm gonna, I have it already configured here, so I'm just gonna like launch it. Um, it'll print it out, what it's doing. And again, there's a few bind variables that go into this statement. I could have just hard coded those ones because the rest of this SQL is very hard coded to our specific data set. So all those new metrics we were just talking about, reply per message, like per post, all these things have a row in this data set. And you can also see how I got zeros in the data set before um, because this case statement will return zeros if a metric has no values. Um, so let's see, this has created the new data set file. So I'm gonna close up the old data set file and, and we're gonna see if it worked. If I did it right, if I did everything right, then there should be no more columns of zeros in my data set. Here's the new file I created. I'm gonna open it up in Excel. Do I feel lucky opening Microsoft Excel in a live stream? All right, I think it worked. I say that because there are times when I swear it's crashed uh, my computer on live stream, which is never fun. So here is the new data set I just created. These old rows should be the same, and I'm just eyeballing. There should be no more columns of zeros, and there are not. So everything has worked. We now have all the metrics calculated for the data set. I can actually quick, we can recalc those statistics. I know I didn't put that on the, the slide of my to-do list, but the statistics is, it's like 5.2, where is it? Stats, all right, all the way at the bottom. I can show you real quick the listing that does the stats. I believe I set a breakpoint, right? It starts out the same as the cohort analysis. It's also gonna use a lot of pandas. And so first, like, you know, good programmers, we check that the data set path is valid. And then we read the data into a pandas data frame, like before. I convert the churn column to a float just so I can get better, it makes the statistics works. And then basically I actually use the, the pandas describe function to catch to calculate the stats. So that's like the main trick here. Number one, use pandas describe to calculate your stats. I like to flip it to the transpose because it makes it, it puts the, um, the metrics on the rows. So now my, now my summary, well, I'll show you it in a sec. I calculate additional stats that they don't do in the simple describe function. I like to have the skew the first and 99th percentiles, and also this is my a little expression which will count the number that have a non-zero value. And then I reorder the columns, and that's pretty much it. This is actually a little, yeah, a little hack. A lot, code doesn't like it when you have these percents in it. 
Uh, Pandos hates that, so I replace the percents with PCT. So that just saves it out, and now I have a new stat file right here. And so this is the raw output of the statistics. Um, not that pretty, but it's very convenient. And why do I do everything in CSV files and open it up in Excel? The reason is because I work with a lot of business people. So if you work with business people on churn, you know, usually they want to get the data in Excel or a spreadsheet, so, or, you know, or a BI tool. You could push this to a BI tool. That would be another great way to do it if you're in a corporate environment. All right, like the tunes, the copyright free gamer music on Spotify, which I can show you right here. Always doing me right, no copyright music for Twitch. Thank you to Kike Virela Rigero for the great tunes. Wouldn't be able to stream without it. All right, so here's the new data set stats. Now, what am I really supposed to be doing? Was new cohort plots for the new metrics. So 11, 12, 13, and 16, it said says here. This, this stream, I actually took notes on what I'm supposed to run rather than like digging around in the configuration file while I'm live streaming, which is, you know, <laughs> just that doesn't seem that professional. Uh, wait, what did I say? 13, dang it, can't even remember. 11, 12, 13, and 16. All right, 11, 12, 13, 16. This will give us our new cohorts for the new metrics. Let's see. And it's just going to save those out as plots. <clears throat> so here are my new plots. So let's see. How about, how does reply per message relate to churn? Hmm, this one looks kind of weird. Let's see. It actually looks like... Having more replies per message is kind of bad, strangely. Although the worst churn, as usual, is these people in the bottom cohort who don't use the service at all. After that, it appears that having a low ratio of replies per message is somewhat beneficial. And if you're replying a lot but me not messaging, I mean, not messaging directly, you have a somewhat higher churn rate. That's what this one's showing us. Now look at, let's look at like per post. This one doesn't really seem to be telling us much. Other than that, people who don't use the service, which are the zeros, they don't, they churn the most. And all the people, the ratio of like per post doesn't really show us that much. So why did I calculate it? Well, this is meant to be like a real case study. And in a real case study, you don't know what's going to show you a strong relationship to churn until you've actually looked at it. So in this case, like per post doesn't seem to be adding too much. Um, other than the usual finding that people who don't, you know, use the service all churn the most. Also, post per message doesn't seem to be telling us that much. I mean, this is again, the bottom cohort is always the people who don't use the service. And then not a big difference in the churn rate for all these other people here. What's the last one? Unfriend per new friend. Well, that one's interesting. Now this one has a somewhat stronger relationship to churn. So here we actually see that if you have a very high ratio of unfriends per new friend, averaging around 0.7, you actually are going to have a pretty high churn rate. Um, significantly higher than people with a low ratio of unfriend per new friend. Now this is interesting because remember, new friend per month itself did not have a very strong relationship to churn. And I think I understand the reason for this. Let's close up these other ones. I want to go back to that unfriend per month, which we just did earlier. So this is like, this is this was the unfriend per month churn cohort. And here we saw that people with a high unfriend per month, slightly higher churn rate. But here, unfriend per new friend, again, the ratio metric, I think, uh, reveals the relationship despite the correlation. So unfriend per new friend actually seems good. And I think that's why I put in my notes here I should do the unfriend per new friend scaled cohort. Uh, and I'm actually surprised I didn't have one defined for that. 
Let's go back to the configuration. Whoop, that's not the configuration. This is not the configuration. That was down here. Let's see, so apparently no unfriend per new friends. Let's see, unfriend. What I wanna do is find that other one we were just using. Which I think was like version 16 or something. So this one was unfriend per new friend. And I wanna make, I wanna analyze the scaled version. So using the time-honored tactic of copy, paste, and modify, I copied the old configuration, I pasted it, now I'm modifying it, and I think the metric name here is just unfriend per new friend scaled. Let's see, let me go back and look at my stats. Unfriend per new friend scaled. Yeah, it looks right, just double check. So now, if we look at cohort 53, and the difference between this one and the original one is that now we're using the scaled unfriend metric. So we actually should get more people uh, in the measurement. So I'm gonna run cohort version 53, which I just added. And we will again see how having unfriend per new friend relates to churn, but now using our better scaled metric. You, that was using the scaled calculation. This one again shows basically similar relationship, but it gives you more data points actually. So not too much different on the relationship, but you can definitely see it's bad to not use the, the social network at all. If you use the social network at all though, you want to have a low value of unfriend per new friend. And the higher value you have unfriend per new friend, the more likely you are, you are to churn. So. There we go. We can finished all these ratio metrics and analyses. And again, the reason I calculated all these different versions of the ratio metric is because in a typical case study, you don't really know what's going to be, you know, the best feature in your data set. I mean, going back, well, I guess, you know, looking at this, I mean, these were these ones in the top left are the basic metrics um, from you know, the events. Come on, get bigger. It's ignoring me. So these were all the basic metrics, like per month, new friend per month, post per month. And I showed the example of analyzing the relationship between ad views and posts. And that turned out to have a pretty strong relationship to churn. But the truth is, you don't really know. I mean, you can be guided by your domain knowledge and intuition, but sometimes you just have to try everything, you know, and see, you know, throw all the spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks, uh, as, the, as the saying goes. So that's why I calculated a wide variety of ratio metrics uh, in this section. Add view per post, reply per message, like per post, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the, you know, finishing up all those metrics and analysis. So what is next? What is next on the stream now is what I advertised. It was not false advertising today, but we are, we are gonna talk about what do you have to do to prepare your data set for regression. And in fact, I've already been preparing the data set for regression for a while um, in the previous chapters and the previous streams where I demonstrated a lot of these techniques. Um, this shows you the whole flow chart of the, the code that you run in my version and the steps that you take. So the first step that you take is exporting the data set. Um, we just did that, but we're gonna do it again. Then after that, you, you scale the metric. So this is going back to the question about um, calculating statistics or normalizing the data set. Rather, you, you, what, I, what many people call normalizing the data or standardizing it, I call scoring the data because I like using business friendly terms, terms that won't scare the business people in your company. And to do that, we calculate these statistics. So you calculate the stats and we save the statistics table, which you actually just saw. So I think we already did that step. Um, then we do the scaling and that is the first step. Then I also teach, or I taught in a previous stream that you have to group the metrics, which is also known as dimension reduction. 
And so then you have to do that. Uh, and then you, the, the, you first you discover what the groups are and then you actually apply the grouping. Um, and you create a loading matrix. And we're, we're gonna go through all these steps right now. So the next part of the stream is actually gonna be kind of a review of all the steps. We touched on these in previous streams. So I'm gonna go through it kind of quick now. But the first thing I need to do is do a new data set export for chapter eight. Um, so I'm gonna go, why is there a new export for chapter eight? The reason is actually because I calculated some, some sort of throwaway metrics earlier. Uh, it, like I calculated multiple versions of the unfriend metric, right? The scaled and unscaled version, but we don't really want all those. So I'm gonna do a new version of the data set um, there's a new version in chapter eight, which has only the metrics you want for moving forward. So if you're following along in the book, at the start of chapter eight, there's a new listing to um, uh, export the data set, and it's actually listing zero. It's the only listing zero in the book, and it, the reason is it's actually not printed in the book. So if you look in chapter eight, this listing is not printed. Normally, they all are. Um, but the reason I didn't reprint this listing in chapter eight is because if you look at it here, it's very similar to the previous data set listings. It just has a few little modifications. Um, like it has the unfriend per new friend using the scaled version, but I don't even say that it's the scaled version. And it has all those ratios and it doesn't have any other stuff that we don't want. So that is just a, a, a new quick data set export at the start of chapter eight, um, if you're following along uh, with the book. It's still called data set two, because it's kind of like conceptually the second data set version in the book. So now I have a new version of the data set. I'm just gonna quickly run, well, let me go back to the flow chart here. This is how I'm supposed to start. So I'm gonna go follow along here. So I did uh, code, listing 8.0 we re-exported a data set that was it here's my reminder to actually run the listing next we're going to do the data set summary um, and we're going to create the statistics table i already did that once in the stream so i'm just going to run it. it says here i'm supposed to use version 2. So let's get back up here have i ever looked at the ratio of tenure to amount paid you know that's a good question um, frontal saucer 16. I haven't looked at that one, but you know, that could be interesting too. It's like you, you never know for what business. Um, it's, they're usually the most interesting when the two are correlated. Um, when, like if tenure and the amount they pay are correlated, like old customers are on the, the premium plan more likely. So you could actually discover, you know, an interesting relationship for your service. I don't know if it's that interesting on the simulation data, honestly. Whoops. I was supposed to rerun the stats. Uh, let's see, stats, but I was supposed to run a version. What does this say? All right, version one, it says I'm supposed to run version two now. Um, but honestly, I don't actually remember ever looking at the ratio of account tenure to MRR myself, now that you do mention it. So I got a new stats table here. Wait a second. No, this isn't right. This is supposed to be after I score the data. So that was actually a mistake. I think I'm give, passing misinformation here. First, you have to do version one. Yeah, that was wrong. You gotta do version one. Let me just double check, make sure I have the right summary stats here. Oh, well, I already had that f file of that name open. Excel does not handle it very well when you rewrite a file. All right, here's my new summary stats. You can see, whoops. Uh, do, do, do. You will see there's a few fewer rows in it. But what I'm just, I'm just also noticing that everything is complete. You know, no zero metrics. So that's my new summary stats. All right, now that is actually required to do, I believe, the next step which is metric scoring. Now metric scoring is also known as uh, normalization or standard standardization. I like to call it scoring so I don't scare the business people. 
by using big words. Business people don't like big words like normalization and standardization. Uh, try saying that 10 times fast. Anyway, so the concept of scoring to me is actually very related to the fact that the, the metrics are skewed, which I'm illustrating here. For a typical metric, most of your customers are grouped down in the low levels, but you have a long tail of outliers um, so that your person who uses the product the most, like a power user, is like 10x, you know, the common users. And when you convert it to a score using the method that I teach, you spread it out um, by doing a log transform. You also do the normal part of normalization of making it zero mean and one standard deviation. Um, and how do we do this with a formula, which I show here? And by the way, this is my data ninja icon. So when I put this on the slide, it means that this is a data ninja move. And for those of you who have actually subscribed to this crazy stream, I believe you can make your own data ninjas like that. <laughs> Doesn't actually look that good because I'm in dark mode. <laughs> can barely see it. But anyway, that's my data ninja. So I'm about to teach you a new version of the scoring formula. Um, the chapter three version is right here. So the chapter three scoring approach is you add one to your metric and that's for count metrics where they can be zero. So you move the minimum from zero to one because you're gonna take the logarithm here. This means natural logarithm right here. So you add one to the metric, take the logarithm that's actually what deals with the skew and the extreme outliers. And we'll look at the code for this in just a minute. And then you subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. That's what this equation here is saying. So hopefully everyone on the stream today is okay with a little bit of equations. If you're actually in data science or statistics, this is very light in terms of the equations. So no worries. But so first you take the log, then you subtract the mean and divide by the standard devi deviation. The problem is what I taught you in chapter three doesn't work for negative metrics. Because remember, well, why did I add one in this term? It's because you can't take the log of zero or a negative number. But in the new data set, we actually added the percent change metric, which can be negative. Actually, this might be worth demonstrating because I haven't called attention to this previously. Percent change metrics can and will be negative. Whoops, that's the wrong one. This is the right one. So let's go up here and zoom in again. And you will see, I think, that percent change metrics can be negative. So here it is actually at the bottom, a little bit hard to see. This is the percent change metric for new friends, which we calculated as an example of doing percent change metrics. Unlike the other metrics, it actually goes negative. So the 50th percentile is at zero. And then actually everyone where their, their, their rate of getting new friends went down, they actually had a negative percent change. And the maximum negative value is minus one or minus 100%, which is what you would get if you went from having, well, basically, if you were getting new friends and, you, and then your rate of getting new friends per month went to zero, you would have minus 100% percent change. So that is why in chapter seven, I also teach a new scoring formula that works with negative values. And I call it the fat tail scoring formula because it works great for metrics that have fat tails or any you know variable or feature that has fat tails. What does fat tails mean? It means there's a lot of extreme outliers. And that is also true for skewed metrics. But the difference is when you say, I say fat tails, I mean they're outliers in both the positive and the negative direction. So, and that's what many people call fat tails. You know, how you have a lot of outliers in both directions. Um, you could also call it fat tails if, you, if it's just heavily skewed, but that's my usage. So you have to use a slightly different formula, which is shown here. So this is the new scoring formula. Instead of doing the log of one plus the metric, you actually use this clever formula here, m plus square root m squared plus one. 
And if you look at this carefully, you will realize that this will always be greater than zero, even if the negative, the metric is negative. Because what happens if your, ne your metric is negative is you'll have a negative term here for m. Like let's say your metric is minus three, then m will be minus three. m squared though will be positive. And then you add one to the square. So this square root here will always be slightly greater um, than m itself. And that way, this will make a negative metric with extreme values always be positive after taking, and the, lo the, log, the log actually deals with the skew. It pulls in the outliers. And then in this formula, we still subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. So this is a very, very useful formula. I call it fat tails uh, scoring or normalization formula. And let's run it. And we, we can stop and look at the code. So it's listing 7.5. I don't believe that I have a configuration for it. Although I might surprise myself. I don't think I do, because I never, you know, I never ran it before. So I'll just basically pick another, well, Pick another configuration and I'll duplicate it. And now this will be FT scores 7.5. I think I just use the regular listing. So this is actually going to um, convert the data to scores. Let's actually look at the listing and put in a breakpoint because this is in Python. So here it is, fat tail scores. Put a breakpoint here where we load the data. So we will see that formula I was just explaining in just a second. So here I am at the breakpoint. You can tell that by chapter seven I got lazy and I stopped checking that, that the data set path existed. But by this point it had better be there. So we load it into a pandas data frame just as I demonstrated before. Now this time I'm actually calculating the metrics that are gonna be the scores. Um, so I'm actually, I make a copy of the original version here. Um, I'm actually gonna drop the churn column from my copy, that's the outcome variable, and we're gonna add it back later. Now next thing here is I'm actually reloading the summary stats. That's actually one reason that I save all those CSVs out in the folder, is because I reload them and reuse them. So it, when I showed you the slide here, and I said, you know, the summary, the statistics table is saved and then it goes into the scoring formula. I mean that quite literally. And this actually addresses the point that was raised earlier that when you, you we're gonna use the same statistics later when we score for uh, out of sample testing. So that's another reason why you save those, save those numbers. If you normalize your data and don't save the mean and standard deviations that you use, then you won't be able to do it properly on your test data. That's kind of a subtle point, but it's good to know. Anyway, so here I'm gonna reload the stats. And here I actually check that the stats exist, or I'll give you a nice warning that you have to, you know, do it first. So now I load the stats, and again, I've, I've got a little stats table. I'll show you this one because it's small. I just loaded that file that we were just looking at. So this is just that table of statistics that we were previously looking at. Actually, this looks like the wrong one, if you ask me. Hmm. Something looks, this looks wrong actually, something's wrong. <laughs> I think I ran the law, maybe I ran the, the wrong version of the stats. It's supposed to be the stats for data set two. So something's actually wrong here. All right, I'm debugging, sorry people. I'm supposed to be running uh, listing 7.5. And let's see. Fat tail scores, maybe it's a configuration thing. All right, I've got two versions, and oh, it's version two for date, uh, no. This should be data set two. I think this is wrong. I think I just found a bug in the book. Sorry, people. If you were doing this in the book, I think you would get the wrong thing. Let me try this version. 
Pretty sure I just found a bug. Don't let me forget this after the stream. I'm gonna have to fix this. Let's see. Load the turn data. Load the stats. Let's look at the stats. It's gotta have all the new metrics or this isn't gonna be working right. Yeah, now it's got all my new metrics. This is the right stats. All right, so now back where we're supposed to be. The first thing we do is check which columns um, are skewed here. And I also look at that they have a minimum greater than zero. And for these versions, I use the skewed column transform, which we'll step into. So this is the simple transform for just skewed columns. Whoops, don't wanna go into that function. Let's go here. These are all these little functions that are, I'm, we were just stepping into these functions here. Now I think we can really step into my own function. So this is that transform of log of one plus the value that I talked about. And there's one column, well it's actually gonna get done for many columns here. So then after this column, I say, I detect the fat tail columns by looking at the skew and also checking if the minimum is below zero. And then we're gonna use the other transform, which is actually just, I believe, right up here. So I'll just put a breakpoint here. And so then we go, we identify the fat tail columns, and then we apply that fat tail, col fat tail transform, which I explained on the slide. So here it is, log of, this is the metric, plus the square root of the metric squared plus one. So that was the fat tail scoring transform that I mentioned, and we should do that. So that's it actually. So now we've transformed the columns and we have to recalculate the means and standard deviations after we've done those log transforms. So here we do it, mean values uh, and the standard deviation values. And these mean values are just, <clears throat> it's just a list of numbers, you know, one for each metric. So these are all the means. Um, after the log transforms. So the means are all pretty small numbers now because even for people who had like a thousand posts per month, that becomes a much smaller number after you take the logarithm. So that's how log taking the log deals with the, the... So this is the line where you subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. And now, as promised, we have to add back on the churn column just from the original data set. And then I save it. Um, I think that's really it. Well, not quite actually. I save out the data and we'll look at the scored metrics in just a sec. So saving results, and that'll print it out here. Well, it'll print it out eventually. Now I'm actually gonna save the details of the scores. I just made this little data set. And again, why am I making this data set of the means these are the means and standard deviations and the transforms that I used. So now I know, um, hmm, shouldn't there be a fat tail? That's actually weird. I feel like this one should have gotten, maybe it wasn't skewed. Hmm, I think I found another problem. Oh God, why do I find all these problems on the live stream? Bad luck. Anyway, I'm saving out all the means and standard deviations so I can reuse them when I have to transform, um, you know, other data using the same statistics. So hopefully that makes sense. And I'm not going to dwell on the fact that my fat tail score formula didn't really get used. So, okay. So what have we accomplished? We are getting closer to having our data ready for regression. So we use the statistics table. I did the metric scoring and I saved out the score parameters. And I've also now produced the score data set. Let's look at the score data set, actually. It'll be here in the folder. This is the new data set um, with all the metrics converted to scores or normalized as most people call it. Well, I mean, most people who are data scientists or statisticians already call this a normalized or standardized data set. Now you can tell that it's a normalized or standardized data set because instead of having all of the original values 
all of these numbers are now small. They're all close to zero and they're all like weird fractions because they all had the logarithm taken divided by some number. And that's true for all these columns. So every column, no matter what it was before, it now looks kind of the same. Um, they're all small numbers uh, with decimal values. So this is our data set all converted to normalized scores, but otherwise it's the same data set. You know, it's the same metrics um, that we had originally. All right, just closing up stuff. So that shows that we have now accomplished turning it to scores. Now the next thing we need to do is handle correlated metrics. Um, and maybe we should recalculate the correlation actually. Let's do that. Let's recalculate the correlation matrix real quick. Um, that will be listing like 6.2. And I'll have to make sure if there's a version for the new data set. This should be, whoops, this is chapter six, da, da, da. I think it's chapter six. No, that's chapter seven. Sorry, wrong chapter. So the correlation matrix will be listing two in chapter six, and the version I want will be, I think this is supposed to be data set two. What the heck? messed up. I should have these. What was I using before for correlation matrix? This is data set three. Well, maybe I'd better not mess up this version. <laughs> Let's make a new version four and we'll look at a correlation matrix for our new data set. And you will see that many of these metrics are significantly correlated. So Let's go back to here. I'm just setting up a new configuration to calculate a correlation matrix on the new data set, I should have, see this is actually correlation listing two. What did I just create? Version three, I think. Was that version? No, I just created version four. So there's lots of different data sets and each one can be a different you know, version. So let's just create the correlation matrix. I won't show you the code for that because it's really, it's a one-liner in pandas. To create a, a correlation matrix from a, a numeric data frame is a, a pandas one-liner. So here is the correlation matrix for our new data set. Looks a little bit hard to read. It'll be easier to see some of the trends once I highlight it. by turning it into a heat map. So you can see, well, the w there's always ones on the diagonal of a correlation matrix, but you can see there are many other highly correlated metrics. The reason I like to look at these in a spreadsheet actually is because you can freeze the panes and then it's actually easier to you know, move around in a big correlation matrix. So you can see a lot of these metrics have high correlations, 0.6, um, some of them, some of them even higher. Um, so dimension reduction has to do with handling when metrics are significantly correlated because you don't want to have those going into your regression. So that is why the next step is actually to find groups in the metrics, which is going to handle those that are correlated together. And I'm not getting any questions in the chat, so I guess everyone's following along. So finding the groups, I'm now gonna review it. Oh, this is actually the scores, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, finding the groups, and we're gonna create a loading matrix. I'm gonna illustrate this right now. This is gonna be a quick review from previous stream. We group the metrics by looking at the correlation matrix and using use a greedy clustering algorithm. So this is illustrating a toy version of the algorithm where if your two most correlated metrics were reading and replying to mes messages, you would group them in the loading matrix. And then we would have a new correlation matrix at step two. And read and reply have now been grouped, but they're still correlated to log in in this toy problem. And so we group them together in a new loading matrix. And now we get this correlation matrix. And the reason I'm doing this so fast is because I already did it in a previous stream. So there's another pair of correlated metrics here, but they're not correlated to the original group. 
So they get new entries in the loading matrix that will group them together. And finally, after grouping these metrics, we've grouped together login, read, and reply. And when we group them, I mean we average them. We average the scores and we average together send and write and then we get a, a correlation matrix with no significant correlations. Now, how do we do that with code? We do it with listing 6.4 from fighting sharing with data. So let's get back to the code and look at this one. Let's see, I have to check the versions also. So we should have, uh, let's see, find metric, metric groups is listing four. And I actually feel like, shouldn't this also have another version? I feel like I'm doing something wrong here because it's not working on data set two. I'm going to have to check the book code after this because I'm just going to like hard code this one to data set two. And then we'll run listing, we'll go to listing six four. This is actually find group. All right, let's run it. Well, actually, let's put a breakpoint so we can, I'm not going to show you everything. This is actually the longest listing in the book is using the clustering algorithm. <clears throat> I will just try to put in a breakpoint at the interesting part, which is up here. So we will try finding the metric groups and it's going to load the data set as usual. Well, it looks like I had a break point in the beginning. So we load the data set as usual. And it is data set two, like it's supposed to be. Um, we're gonna actually load the scores, which we just calculated. So that's gonna load the new score data. As you, often we do in these analyses, we drop the churn column because it's not gonna be part of this. And now this function down here is actually gonna find the correlation. Uh, find the correlated groups. This is where I put that other breakpoint. This is actually the grouping algorithm using a Python, using a SciPy clustering package. This is actually what I use to do the grouping. So you don't actually run that algorithm that I just described. We just use um, SciPy cluster. It's called hierarchical clustering. Is actually the proper name for this clustering algorithm. Um, this algorithm actually works in terms of dissimilarity. So I turn the correlation matrix. This variable is actually the correlation matrix we were just looking at. I can prove it to you by showing you this great heat map in uh, PyCharm. So this is the correlation matrix, but we're going to turn it into a dissimilarity matrix by subtracting it from one so that the most dissimilar elements now have a highest. That would be if they had minus one correlation, now they would have a two dissimilarity. And the most similar elements had a one correlation, so now they have a zero similarity. Now the hierarchy function is actually what finds the relationship between the groups. Why not use k-means or k-prototype to create the groups? Hmm, you could use k-means, but I really want to cor you know, find the correlated metrics. So I work directly on the correlation matrix. This actually gives us a threshold. So here I'm actually specifying a correlation threshold, which in this case is set to 0.65. So it means that in my resulting correlation matrix, there should be no correlations greater than 0.65. So I like to use these correlation specific approaches because, well, I mean, that's what I really care about. <laughs> so it's more direct. I mean, you could use like a, a k-means and then you'd have to check that it also had the desired result on the correlation matrix. Um, anyway, so this is the hierarchical clustering in SciPy. The linkage function actually finds the relationship. Another comment, have to head out. All right, bye frontal saucer 16, see you later. Meeting next week with O'Reilly. Oh, about your book. Yes, you're considering writing a book. 
Well, don't forget my words of warning about writing a book. It's one-third writing, one-third editing, and what's the final third of work you have to do writing a book? I'm doing it right now. I'm promoting the book. You have to, like, even after you write your book, you have to help. <laughs> yes, it's the promo. It's, you got to make sure people know about your book and hopefully want to read it. Although my attitude is, you can, if you learn everything you need on these streams, don't buy the book. You know, the, op the open source code is for people to use. The book is to help you understand it, and so is the stream. So get the book if you want to, you know, read the details. Anyway, back to this algorithm. The F cluster step is what actually finds the groups. That's where you put in the thresholds. So the linkage function actually just finds the relationships between the, the, the most similar elements. Like it figures out what is the most similar, the next most similar, and it produces the hierarchy of similarity. The cluster function actually takes your desired threshold and finds it. So the truth is this operates pretty differently than the toy algorithm I demonstrated. But that was just for intuition. Now after this function, I've actually got the groups, but the rest of these helper functions are to relabel them and turn them into the loading matrix, which is what I actually need. Um, this first function relabels the clusters so that the cluster with the most elements in it is number zero, the cluster with the second most is number one, etc. And then this function actually takes the cluster assignments and turns them into a loading matrix. Whoops, looks like I got a breakpoint in this one too. Uh, I, don't, I didn't want to step through all this. So I'm going to take out these breakpoints. I did this in a previous stream. If you really want to get in, into the weeds on it, check out my previous stream. So this function, after we've called it, this will give me my loading matrix, which is what I needed. So this should look like a loading matrix. <clears throat> so I'm grouping these three metrics together, grouping these two, grouping these two, and then leaving most of the metrics actually independent here. But we'll go through this. And the final step here is actually just saving the loading matrix. And now I should have my new loading matrix saved out in my favorite directory. Uh, and I also have, uh, wait, the metric, for, this is a list of, the, of what's in the group. So let's look at the loading matrix first. So here's that loading matrix. And I'll explain more about the loading matrix in like two secs. That's like the next thing. But this is the loading matrix, which tells you which metrics I've grouped. And it also gives the weights to form the average. Um, you might wonder why these weights are not like third, third, third. That's actually, a, a scaling constant to keep the standard deviation of the group to one or close to one. That's detailed in the book. I won't go into the weeds on that right now. But so this shows that the first three metrics are in one group. Um, unfriend per month and unfriend per new friend are in another group. Message per month and reply per month are in another group. And the reason is because these are what was really correlated in that correlation matrix. And we'll take another look at that in a sec. Um, so this was my loading matrix. This was my old correlation matrix. Uh, we're gonna, we'll make a new version in a minute, actually. It's kind of cool. After we do the loading matrix, you can make a... Well, well, actually, we should look at the new correlation matrix, but let's do that in a sec. We'll stick with the program here. After we found the metric groups, we created the loading matrix, and now we're actually going to group the metrics by applying the loading matrix. So how do you do that? I've got, this is another slide from an old stream. I'm gonna go through this fast because um, look for the stream that says chapter six and it'll go into all the gory details of this. But the reason it's great to encode your groupings in a loading matrix is because that also gives you the technique to calculate the averages on a big data set. So this is a toy example of matrix multiplication. So this is my pretend little data set here. I have login, read, reply, send, write, like, and this is my pretend loading matrix. The average of, for group one, which is the average of login, read, and reply, is the result of the, mel the matrix multiplication in which you, the first element, you multiply the first 
column of the second matrix by the first row of the first. And then similarly for these other elements, um, that's actually what how you can calculate the grouped metrics or the, the dimension reduced data set after you have your loading matrix. So that's why we went to all the trouble of making and saving a loading matrix. It's not just cool, but we want to actually run it now um, by running listing 6.3. I might have to set this one up for another version too. There's 6.3, but uh, I don't think I want to look at this. Let's go back here. We don't need to look at 6.4 anymore. <clears throat> oh yeah, I changed it to data set 2 here. And now I just run apply metric groups uh, version on data set two. So let's just make sure uh, we'll put a breakpoint in it. Whoops. That's in uh, apply metrics groups is actually listing six three. Oh, it's already got a breakpoint, so let's just hit it. And you'll see the matrix multiplication is actually super easy. Sounds hard, right? Matrix multiplication? Nah, it's easy in Python. So here I'm loading my data set, which is all those scores. You have to do this on scores, by the way. You don't do this grouping on unnormalized data because it wouldn't make any sense to average together metrics of different units. But after, that's why we first converted the metrics to scores. Um, I can go into more on that. Um, wait, this is a great question. Did Carl already answer? I have to know, yeah. Okay, well anyway, I think we're good on the chat. Let me know if anyone else wants to know anything chat-wise. So here I'm loading my score data, and as usual, I'm dropping my churn column before I work on it mathematically. Next, I'm gonna load my loading matrix here, and I'm gonna make sure it's really there, and I'm gonna load it. And now this should be my new loading matrix right here. I'm just checking, yep, looks like the loading matrix we were just looking at, so I'm in the right place. Now the next thing I have to do is turn it to a NumPy array, and for those of you who aren't familiar, a NumPy array is just a numeric matrix. Um, so I've basically taken my loading matrix and turned it into um, a numeric matrix. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the data, that's this variable. Um, with my 24,000 row by 16 column matrix. I'm actually also here reordering it. I actually put in a comment here. Make sure the data is in the same column order as the rows of the loading matrix. That's very important, or obviously the matrix multiplication would give you garbage results. And it's not guaranteed that they're in the same order. This would actually also drop metrics in the data that are not in the loading matrix. And then also here I called to NumPy so that it's, you know, now we've got two NumPy arrays, one for the data that I'm gonna group and one for the loading matrix. And here's the matrix multiplication. So that's all there is to it. Isn't matrix multiplication hard? Nah, it's easy with Python, <laughs> with, with NumPy. <laughs> all right, so now this is my new group data and now I'm gonna turn it back into a data frame and reattach my churn column before saving it. And that's really it. That saves the group data. Uh, let me like run out the rest of this. And now I have a new data set and this is actually what I'm going for. This is the result that we need to run the regression. It's a data set where all of the metrics or features as you may call it, um, have been converted to normalized scores first. Um, and second, all of the highly correlated metrics have been grouped together. And I'm trying to show it to you, but it's not opening. Let's see. Here we go. Uh, they always open up in my other window and then I have to drag them over here. There we go. So now this is the, the, the data set with grouped scores for those metrics in which we wanted to. So we actually have fewer columns in the data set now. So this actually was dimension reduction. 
Although I didn't reduce it by that much because the truth is this isn't a very realistic example. Um, in a real data set that you would probably be working with at a typical company, you might have 50 to 100 or maybe even two or 300 different metrics of your customers. And you might have dozens of them, like maybe 50 all correlated that so much that they should be grouped together. This is really just a toy problem from the simulation because I, don't, I didn't want to make it too hard to like follow along with a book. But so now I've lost several metrics and they've formed into these groups. Um, and all of the less correlated metrics stayed um, ungrouped. And now also I made this little list. I saved this out for later. It's useful to keep track of which metrics were in your groups um, without reading. You could get it from the loading matrix, but it's actually convenient just to save out this little file which shows you, you know, what was in each group. So it actually gets reloaded by some of the later code. So this is actually what we've accomplished. Um, we've now basically, you know, check complete, you know, we've made a grouped data set here at the bottom, which is what we want for regression. And I figure for the last thing I'll do on the stream, I think I don't have too much else. I'm going to show you the correlations of the group data to prove to you that they were not that correlated. So I'm going to go back out to um, the, the listing <laughs> configuration and show you the first thing we can do is calculate the ordered correlation matrix, which is chapter six, listing five. And that actually is very good illustration. You have to do that after you do the listings. I'm actually just gonna run this. Um, and you can see how the groups actually correspond to correlation. I don't think I had a breakpoint, so hopefully that just worked. Okay, yeah, I saved an ordered correlation matrix. And this is the order of the loading matrix. That's the key. So first, this is the correlation matrix ordered in the way given by the loading matrix. And we should be able to see the groups. Yes. Pretty clear, actually. You can see why these first three metrics, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. You can see why these first three metrics were grouped together because they're very highly correlated. And also this next pair, the unfriend, uh, two metrics of unfriend per month are grouped together. And also messaging and replying. These are actually the most correlated. Uh, those had 0.84 correlation. So they were also grouped together. Now these other ones here, you know, these are actually pretty correlated too. These are like 50 to 50 something percent correlated, but uh, I kind of chose the threshold to keep them separate because it makes the regression result more interesting in the next chapter. So this shows you, you can, this is another listing in the book. After you find the group, it's very instructive to rerun the correlation matrix and you can really see when you make a heat map that those war matrix were much more correlated. Yes, book, the book. Uh, and then the other thing to mention is we should look at the correlation for the grouped scores. And I'll prove to you that they all have lower correlations by rerunning the data set correlation matrix on data set to actually, I don't even see the version that I want here. I guess I want to run on data set. I'm going to make a new version, version five, and I want to do data set two group score. Cause actually, I, it's actually the one I've been working with today. So we're going to run correlation matrix version five real quick. Let's see. Uh, that was 6.2 version 5. Because I told you that core, that approach to, to grouping or clustering, or, or rather dimension reduction, as you might call it, it you know, it's based on the correlation and it should be guaranteed to give you only correlations below the threshold that I set. 
So this is the correlation matrix for the group scores, and it should be somewhat smaller because we got you know, several metrics together into groups. Um, it is a little bit smaller. That's the dimension reduction part. So we're down to 13 metrics when we started out with around 16. Now, as far as the actual correlations, it should be kind of apparent. I mean, I actually used a pretty high threshold of 0.65, um, but what we should be able to see here is that other than the diagonals, there are no longer any correlations above 0.65, because that was my threshold. Actually, I see one that's 0.67. Oh man, I'm so busted. <laughs> it's supposed to work. Ah, how did that happen? Well, it's a little noise in the algorithm, but you try it and you'll see that it'll actually reduce all the correlations that are above the threshold. I guess it actually, oh, you know what happened here? It actually ended up with a correlation between one of the other metrics and the groups. So the correlation between the group and one of the original metrics was actually higher hmm, than between the original metrics. Well, anyway, that's not too bad. So it really did produce a new data set where there are only lower correlations and there are fewer metrics. So that was the point of doing all that grouping. And as you may know you don't want to have correlated metrics when you do a regression and you also want everything to be normalized so that's why um that's what we were doing <laughs> so i think that's actually it i think i've done everything that i needed to do today i'm gonna go into the regression next week um it's just too much for one stream but i had to catch up on all this hey thanks scott thank you for saying you found this interesting it wasn't just like me rambling for an hour and a half so to summarize what did i talk about today fighting churn is about targeted interventions like improving your product hey a new follower tsumnia who it's kind of like tsunami that's very clever so thank you for following me tsumnia it's like tsunami but kind of different um yeah thanks D Borgismin. <laughs> yep, like Tsunami, Tsumnia. Let's see. The metrics we use summarize customers' events and subscriptions, and those are also called features. If you're already a data scientist or statistician, these are the features, you know, of your data set. Uh, metric cohorts is a cool way to see what metrics are related to churn, and it's good because it's easy to understand and easy for business people to act on. We also looked at ratio metrics, which show relationships between correlated metrics and churn. And then we looked at preparing a data set for regression. And the key steps there are you have to convert it to scores, which is normalization. And then you want to group correlated metrics, which is also known as dimension reduction. And again, I don't say dimension reduction with business people because it's just confusing for them. So among us data people, we can say dimension reduction. But when you show this to your business column, colleagues, I should say, the business people at your company, you just want to say, I grouped the correlated metrics. And they'll be like, okay, that makes sense. But if you say, I reduced the dimension, they're like, what are you talking about, man? What are you taking? What, what dimension are you on? You know? So don't say dimension reduction to business people. But yep, that's it for today. Next week, we will actually do the logistic regression. Let's see, yes, next stream, logistic regression with all this great data that we've prepared. We are now ready to finally talk about logistic regression and stop with all the analytics. We'll do real data science next time. I actually don't believe that. I think all of this analytics and preparation is real data science. Um, not only regression and machine learning is data science. So that next stream, next Saturday at 2, that's my only streaming time right now. Um, on Sundays, I'm working on a new project with Manning Books, and during the week, I have a day job. Um, and they wouldn't want me live spending time on Twitch when I'm supposed to be, you know, being a data scientist. Um, you can also see this on demand on YouTube, although you're all on Twitch, why would you watch YouTube? It's just the same content. And I also highlight and save all my old streams on Twitch, I should mention. So, um, yeah, 
Check it out. But tell your friends who don't watch Twitch. That's what the YouTube is for. You can also get the book. Uh, this is the book that has all this. It's much more detail than I'm giving you here. And there's a discount code. So you can get it uh, for cheap, cheaper for my publisher. And they'll know you watch the stream. Um, also, here's how you can connect with me. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. If you send me a message saying that you're interested in churn, you watch my stream, I'll definitely connect with you. Um, also, please follow me on Twitter. That's how I, can, I give updates about the stream, um, other things that, uh, that I'm doing, and stuff like that. And also, well, you're already watching the Twitch stream, so I don't know why I'm telling you about that. So, here we go. Uh, next week, regression analysis with Python and SQL, studying customer churn. Uh, same time, same place. Hope you can join me. Let's see. We have a pretty good crowd still here. Let's see if there are any good streams that we can raid. I only like raiding other, you know, data streams, but maybe we can like raid some coding streams. I don't know if anyone has like a favorite stream they would want to raid. Let me just see who's live right now that I actually follow. I generally follow music and coding. Those are my two interests on Twitch. <laughs> uh, I'm not really a gamer, although I do play a lot of Minecraft. If any of you guys are Minecraft uh, players, that's the only game I really am into. So let's see, rating another stream that's coding or data. Let's see, does anyone want to raid? I mean, I'll show you that what we what our choices are. Let's see, there is my stream paused. <laughs> Let's see, I'll show you what I'm looking at. We could raid, I develop things. I don't know, should we do it? Or Blow. Let's go with the underdog and I'll raid I develop things. And you guys just bail. You don't want to raid I develop things, just bail. I'm going to raid us over there just because it's fun to raid other people and see what they're doing as long as it's code. So raiding, I'm actually not that good at doing this. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining my stream this week. We are about to try to raid another coding stream, which is always fun. It's not data science. That's the best when we can raid another data science stream, but there aren't that many. Not that many streamers are doing data. So let's see if this works, if I type this right. So anyway, thank you all for joining me. I should go back to my goodbye slide here before I type the raid thing. And I'll see you all in iDevelop things. We'll see how he's doing. And have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you all for joining to me, me today. Hope you found it interesting and useful. Um, I'm out, but I'll see you next week.